in, in line with that, there was a study done by a professor at Stanford and, and one at Columbia that showed that when food was made available in urban areas where it, nutritious food had not been available in the past, that consumers did not necessarily buy that food unless there was the behavior change work that was performed that gave the consumers reason to purchase different food. So the, the, the data is beginning to build up around the need for the behavior change uh, and awareness making work that uh, I think too often we forget. Martin, let me come back to you. Yep. You said that we can begin even without evidence. If we begin without evidence, in ah, incomplete evidence. Because, he, because my question to you was then, what are the metrics that we would use to measure our success if we don't have sufficient evidence to know what policies we need to implement in order to drive or accelerate the change that is necessary to uh, increase nutrition opportunities? No. Well, first of all, it's a really good question. But the, 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 I think the point is that um, you know, when, because I had to talk about HIV AIDS, no? And 10 years ago, we didn't have the perfect treatment. We didn't have, we didn't know how to deal with all the legislation. So, but we knew what the elements were to start with, to do actions. And I think, so everything was action oriented, knowing that in fact, we had to get more knowledge you know, but in all the gaps. So why, if you look at uh, the gaps from a an, from an health perspective, treatments were developed over the past 10 years. Incredible, now life expectancy is about the same, you know, when you have HIV. But it wasn't the case 10 years ago. So, but even when it comes to uh, rights of, of lesbians and gays, for example, it was 10 years ago, it was still quite devastating in many places in the world. But we developed those steps too. So what I, what I try to say is that, of course you need evidence. You know, I'm a scientist, like, yeah, now more than a year ago, but okay. But the, but the point is that you can't wait for the perfect evidence. You have to have actions. But, but and, and this point is that also most of the development was there even when we didn't know. So, you know, when Akhtar Ahmed and I were working together in Bangladesh, you know, a long time ago, Bangladesh had almost 80% stunting levels. Now we have 35. So there is a lot of progress. And sometimes we do cross-sectional analysis as if things you know, are still the same. No, it was worse you know, like 20, 30 years ago. So learn from what happened even when we didn't have so many programs. Of course, it was GDP, right. but other things too. And I think, I think just so for me, the, 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 the perfect solution is the problem. So all are wicked problems. Wicked problems wow. needs 100 solutions. And each of the solutions can maybe contribute only 2% or 3%, but it still helps. Mm -hmm. And then I agree completely with Purnima and, 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 and you know, with, with you also, Eamon, that you have seen it at Google. If you look at urbanization and you look at people, young people, they know what they want to change. They want healthy food. They want sustainable food. They want food which they like built on that instead of trying to say, oh, you know, we need, you know, but yeah, we need, of course we need change of behavior, but there is a lot of behavior change already going on in Shanghai, in Lagos, and in New York, built on what is going on instead of trying to reinvent the wheel all the time. Terrific. Build on what's going on instead of trying to reinvent the wheel all the time. I like that. And that gets me right to you, Fred, too. You talked about the con community level action that we need to perform. Can you give us specific examples of what kinds of things can be done at community level to, to uh, scale up successes and accelerate progress? Sure. And, um, and maybe just sort of continuing with some of the, the HIV theme that Martin raised, too. I think the HIV community provides another good example where it wasn't just, a, there was a recognition you can't just focus on prevention and treatment. You need to look at all of those other household needs that are impacted by the disease burden. And so the care and support that came out of that, looking at issues around psychosocial support and livelihoods and nutrition. Um, and I think that's, uh, you know, nutrition is just as complex, if not much more complex. And so, uh, particularly looking at sort of the household level and the support that's needed along that sort of development continuum, particularly around 
uh, economic strengthening around income generation, um, but also child development and um, being done in a way that promotes equity and empowers girls and women in particular, uh, I think is, is really critical. Terrific, thank you. Harvey, let me come to you, back to you. You ended talking about incentivizing the change that's necessary. Can you give us some uh, specific examples of, of uh, what you mean when you say incentivize? So basically what I mean is if we look at evidences of uh, such programs which have been successful, this, the programs that have been purely based on philanthropic capital or programs that are purely based like a welfare programs have had less success than programs which has brought multiple stakeholders together uh, and, and have incentivized if, say for example, for, for the producer, the farmer, what's the incentive? Today, the only incentive most farmers have is higher yield. What is, the, what is the added incentive to grow nutritious food and not just uh, you know, focus on yield? So incentivizing the entire value chain rather than just making it like a welfare program is something that, that I meant. And a very quick, very quick one sentence on behavior communication change. I, I agree of the importance of that, but unless behavior communication change is is clubbed with affordability because there is a huge difference between staple food and their cost and uh, diversified yes. food and their cost. And so behavior communication change, unless you are not able to you know, make that affordability, will, will have only half its benefit. So, <laughs> so Pranima, you talked about the need for behavior change. But you also talked about the challenges of private sector and the behaviors that they are driving. How do we bring private sector to the table in the right ways to support the type of multi-sectoral change in behavior that you've just described? How much time do we have to talk about that? <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's, it's a difficult space, and, and I, I think um, it's a challenging space to navigate. It's an important space to navigate because, of course, the private sector is central to the food that's available in front of us, to what's happening with what farmers produce and get, gets picked up and moved out to markets and all of that stuff. Um, but there are things that, that I, I think we, we need to talk about very explicitly. We need to talk about uh, the private sector's behavior around the marketing of unhealthy foods, uh, I, I think we need to talk about the sticks and the carrots. Um, my discomfort has been that a lot of private sector conversation leading up to this point has been mainly about bring industry to the, to the table and, and incentivize and believe that good practice will emerge. It doesn't. Everything we have learned about public health from the tobacco world, from uh, especially from tobacco, from uh, formula marketing tells us that the private sector does not voluntarily just decide to do things that are in the public good. The tobacco industry examples, I think, are really, really important for the nutrition community look, to look at and to look at really carefully uh, because it hasn't stopped. It has not stopped. The bad behavior on, on the side of private sector on tobacco has not stopped. Um, so if we don't very explicitly consider that and then say, okay, look, we need you to stop doing these, these, these things, and we need to talk about all the good things you, you can do and you should do, um, that's how we're going to get to the right place as public health, as people who care about public health. Um, I want the industry to be at the table, but I want them to be at the industry and to, at the table and not do the harmful things that they're doing, first and foremost, or to start to reduce those. And, and, and then come to the table with the good things that they can do. Tremendous experience with, with uh, marketing and behavior change. Um, Alive and Thrive worked with leading marketing agencies like Ogilvy and Martha, like J. Walter Thompson. These are the companies that have also been supporting industry to market unhealthy foods to us. But Alive and Thrive used the same uh, strategies that, that you know, these companies uh, know about and the behavioral science they work with to promote healthy behaviors, but the budgets don't match up. My understanding is that in Vietnam, the, the formula industry was spending 15 times Alive and Thrive's mass media TV campaign budget to, uh, to promote formula. 
when they were trying to promote breastfeeding. So, you know, so I, I, I think that the knowledge exists in the private sector and, and we need to just uh, really find a way to, to stop the harm and really get to do more good. Mm -hmm. And we haven't talked enough about stopping the harm. Allert, thank you, Panima. Allert, can you give me an example of what kind of positive action we can perform at the community level to scale up successes and accelerate progress? Well, um, scaling up uh, is sometimes a very difficult, difficult issue. Uh, um, I, I, I acknowledge the, the, the great progress that has been made in Bangladesh. But Bangladesh has, a, has, has one advantage. It's, 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 a, it's a huge population on, living on relatively small surface. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, 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 it's homogeneous. Um, it, 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 is, it, is, it, is, it is so you, you, you can develop a model like BRAC has done, for example, you were alluding to it, and, and Abed was here yesterday as well. Mm -hmm. uh, develop a model, research it, make it work, and then roll it out almost as a military operation. In other countries, and um, uh, going back to also what, what the Vice Minister uh, um, uh, from Laos yesterday said, we have a whole 140 uh, ethnic minorities, um, all requiring a different approach. I don't say it will always be fundamentally different, but there will always be differences. And it's very difficult to scale it up. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to scale it up. Um, um, but simultaneously, you cannot say we don't do it for you. Because if we take um, leave no one behind seriously, we also have to adapt to the smaller groups. Now, then it comes to the, the conditions. Again, and let me give one example from Laos. We have a program that we implement in two different areas. One is wor working well, others is facing challenges. Why is it facing challenges? Suddenly, uh, the governments of uh, this part of the world have decided to build a big railroad, and the railroad requires a lot of casual labor. So, suddenly, in those communities, there is an influx of cash. Now, it's very difficult to convince people that it should be, they should go back to home gardening. You, know, you can buy it there. So, we have to adapt it. We have to, we have to be prepared to be flexible and to say, well, this doesn't work here. Let's try out something else. Well, thank you. Let me very quickly, we have a few seconds left. One word, there are no civil bullets, but one word from each one of you on what we need to do to accelerate the, our efforts to drive nutrition security across the global community. Martin, you first. One word. One word, Jesus. <laughs> give me three words. Nope, okay, give me three, go ahead. Okay. Embrace uh, urbanization because, oh. That's too many words. Fred. <laughs> Sharing. Sharing. There is no such thing as a model. No such thing as a model. <laughs> Reshape consumer behaviors. <laughs> Learn. Learn, share, behavior change. Uh, we have, we've heard it all. And uh, this has been a great panel. I want to thank you all very much for your presentations this morning. I want to end by thanking IFPRI and FAO for bringing us together, not just to talk about the challenges, but to identify the solutions. We know what we need to do to move beyond just the programs and pilots that we have today to sustainable solutions that will ensure that we do achieve SDG2 and that no child goes to bed hungry, but more importantly, they go to bed nourished with brains that will ensure they can live life to their full potential. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much.